my dear sisters and brothers, the first talk of the Life in the Spirit seminars is on God's love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. No other verse in the Bible so crisply summarizes God's relationship with humanity and the way of salvation. I have checked in 22 various translations, and each one of them either say, for God so loved the world, or for God loved the world so much. If I say God loves the world, that would be a half-truth. The full truth is that God loves the world so much, or that God loves the world very much. God loves the world. Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 tells us about the beginning when God began creating the heavens and the earth. The earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the waters. Then God began creating. God created this entire universe. On the first day, he created light. On the second, he formed the sky. On the third, he made earth and the seas. On the fourth day, he made day and night. On the fifth, he created the various creatures. And on the sixth, he created humankind, man and woman. God was happy with his creation. And on the sixth day after creating man and woman, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. God created all these things, and he gave them to men. God gave men dominion over his entire creation because he so loved humankind. The psalmist in Psalm 8 verse 6 says, You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet. We are the most marvelous of God's creation because we are created in his image and likeness. The psalmist in Psalm 8 verse 5 says, You have made him a little lower than the angels and crown him with glory and honor. Again in Psalm 139, verse 14, the psalmist says, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. These words are a clear statement about the amazing capabilities of the human body that God has created, with billions of cells and innumerable parts. We are walking miracles. I believe that there are over 7.6 billion people all over the world. No one is alike. At least the fingerprints differ. Each one is unique. And that's what our response should be. I thank you, God, for the wonder of my being. We are God's handiwork, his masterpieces. Hence, we are beautiful miracles of God. I have a poster at home which reads, You are beautiful, I know, because I made you. Signed, God. Each page of the Holy Bible is packed with God's endearing words, phrases, and sentences. I love you. I am with you. You are precious to me. I delight in you. You are my son, you are my daughter. Fear not, I will never abandon you. I will not forsake you. I've come to give you life and life in abundance. Let us take some of the passages from the Holy Bible. Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 33. I will be their God and they shall be my people, says the Lord. In Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 16, it says, My beloved is mine, and I am his. Now in Deuteronomy, chapter 32, verse 10, 
It talks about Moses when he says that God sustained him in the desert land, in a howling wilderness. He shielded him, cared for him, guarded him as the apple of his eye. This is a figurative expression for something very valuable and precious. Let's turn to Isaiah 49, verses 15 and 16. Can a woman forget her nursing child or show no compassion for the child of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I, says the Lord, will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you, I have graven you, I have carved you on the palms of my hands. Again, in Jeremiah 31, verse 3, the Lord says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Now, in Psalm 91, verse 4, the psalmist says that he will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield. I remember reading an article in the National Geographic magazine several years ago that provides a penetrating picture of God's wings. There was a forest fire in the Yellowstone National Park and the forest rangers began their trek up on a mountain to assess the damage. One ranger found a bird literally petrified in ashes perched on the ground at the base of a tree. Somewhat sickened by that eerie sight, he knocked over the bird with a stick. When he struck it, three tiny chicks scurried from under the dead mother's wings. The loving mother, keenly aware of impending disaster, had carried her offsprings to the base of the tree and had gathered them under her wings, instinctively knowing that their toxic smoke would rise. She could have flown to safety, but had refused to abandon her babies. When the blaze had arrived and the heat had scorched her small body, the mother remained steadfast. Because she had been willing to die, those under the cover of her wings would live. That's exactly what the psalmist says, that he will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. My dear brothers and sisters, let's turn to Psalm 36, verse 7. How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. God has expressed his love not only in words, but also by his actions. He continually sent his messengers to the people, asking the people to return to him. We have the examples of Noah, Abraham, the kings and the prophets. Finally, God sent Jesus. Has he stopped loving us? No, he never will. He said that his love is everlasting. God has made a covenant with his people. And God's love is everlasting. That's what Jeremiah 31 verse 3 says. His love is sacrificial. Romans 5, 8 and John 15, 13. Now if you turn to Romans 5, 8, it says, God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now John 15 verse 13 says, no one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friend. His love, Lamentations says, is steadfast and unconditional because Lamentations chapter 3 verses 22 and 24 talks about the steadfast love of the Lord which never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Matthew 14 verse 14 talks about the compassionate love of God. Then again, if you read Isaiah 43 verse 1, 
we are told that God's love is redeeming love. Then the psalmist talks about God never slumbers in Psalm 121 verses 3 and 4. God did not spare his son. Romans 8, 32. He did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us. God's love is a personal love. Exodus 33, verse 17, where the Lord says to Moses, I will do the very things that you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. St. Augustine had summarized it so well when he said that God loves each one of us and Jesus died for each of us as if there were only one human being on earth. St. Paul in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 tells us that he loved us and gave himself up for us. And finally, we know that the love of God is a covenanted love. Before I talk to you about the covenanted love, let me tell you that God is love and his nature is only to love. St. John in his first letter, chapter 4, verse 16, states that God is love. He uses dynamic rather than static words to describe and define God. John did not say that God has love but rather that he is love. And so God always and only loves. It is the nature of the sun to give off warmth and light. The sun always shines, always radiates its warmth and light. Now you and I can stand under the sun and allow its warmth to make us warm, or we can allow its light to fill our senses and surroundings with light. However, we can also separate ourselves from the sun in partial ways or even completely. We can put a sun umbrella or a parasol over our heads or we can lock ourselves in a dark dungeon where the sun cannot possibly reach us. Whatever we do, whether we stand in the sun or separate ourselves from it, we know that the sun itself does not change. The sun does not go out. If I lock myself in a dungeon, likewise it is with God's love. It is forever. We can either accept it or reject it. Unfortunately, men have rejected the love of God. God gave man a choice to accept his love or to reject his love. This is the free will that God gave his people. Sadly, we have rejected God's love. Man has separated himself from God, and separation from God is sin. Sin has brought evil, pain, suffering, injustice, and violence. It was man's choice, a deliberate turning away from God and walking away from him, rejecting his love, his light, and his warmth, and living in dungeons where everything is dark and hopeless. Now, why do we fail to understand the love of God? There are a couple of reasons. The first reason could be that we have a wrong notions of God. We think that God is a harsh judge or like a policeman, or we equate God with our earthly father. The next reason could be because of so much of suffering and pain, or it could be the deception of the world and Satan. It could also be because we don't have known an earthly father like the orphans and the abandoned children. They have never known an earthly father. Or we love the things of the world more than we love God. This is exactly what John said in his first letter. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I remember reading a beautiful poem way back in 1979. It spoke about if God went on a strike. It goes something like this. It's just a good thing God above has never gone on strike because he wasn't treated fair or things he didn't like. 
if he had ever once sat down and said, that's it, I'm through. I've had enough of those on earth. So this is what I will do. I will give orders to the sun, cut off your heat supply, and to the moon, give no more light, and run those oceans dry. Then just to make it tough and to put the pressure on, turn off the air and oxygen till every breath is gone. Do you know he would be justified if fairness were the game? For no one has been abused or treated with disdain. And yet he carries on supplying you and me with all the favors of his grace and everything for free. Sisters and brothers, God's love is faithful. God's love is unconditional. God is forever inviting us to return to him, even when we have distanced ourselves from the riches of his love. In the parable of the prodigal son, the father longs for the return of his son. When the son does come back, his own life and fortunes in shambles, the father runs down the road to embrace his son. The son did not have to win the father's love. He had never lost the love of the father. He only had to return home and accept his love. I remember reading a story about a father and a son who had a massive fight. And the son walks out with his share and threatens never to return home. The son survives for a few years with his friends. And soon he gets into serious trouble. He gets a good bashing and lies lonely at home, wounded, sick and hungry. Then in his misery, he remembers his father and sends a note with his friend. He tells his father that he wants to return home the next week. And in case you welcome him to tie an yellow ribbon on the oak tree in the garden. On that day, in trepidation, when the son is taken home, he sees not only an yellow ribbon, but the whole oak tree and all the trees in the garden filled with yellow ribbons. The father welcomed the son. That's the welcome our God gives us when we come back to him. That's this beautiful hymn we sing, Lord, I'm coming home. And when we return home, we find the arms of God wide open. Sisters and brothers, God accepts us as we are. No questions asked, no condemnation. And as we embrace a loving God in total acceptance and surrender, he will change us into beautiful people, pleasing and acceptable to him. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 says, Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like snow. Though they are like crimson, they shall be like wool. Then again in John 8, 1 to 11, the story about the woman caught in adultery. Jesus asks her, has no one condemned you? And she says, no one, sir. And then Jesus tells her, neither do I condemn you. Go your way. And from now on, do not sin again. Now, how do we reconcile the existence of suffering with the existence of a loving God? If God can put a stop to suffering, why doesn't he? This is one of the questions that I want to ask God when I get to heaven. Let us remember, sisters and brothers, that suffering and pain was not part of God's perfect plan. Let's take an example. The example of Adam and Eve. They disobeyed God by eating from the tree of knowledge in the middle of the garden and brought upon themselves so much of pain and suffering. Then we have the story about the prodigal son, where the son says, give my share. And he traveled to a distant land and squandered all the wealth. Both Adam and Eve and the prodigal son chose to do wrong. And because of their choices, they brought upon themselves so much of pain and suffering. We have strayed too far away from God. And now God has to write straight in our crooked lines. He will make all things straight for us. 
He will work everything for our good. Just trust him. Can you? Will you? Shall we? Now we don't understand many things. We are finite. God is infinite. Whenever we use our finite intelligence in an effort to understand our infinite God, we are going to collide with the dead end of mystery. God's ways are simply not our ways. For example, there's so many things I can't understand. Can you explain how a buffalo that is black, that eats green grass, gives white milk? Do we grasp the wisdom of Jesus' passion and death on the cross? Personally, I also don't understand why our loving God should passionately love me, a sinner. There's a beautiful song that says, His ways are higher than mine, and his thoughts are wiser than mine. And Isaiah 55 verse 9 reminds us that for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Remember, no matter what the suffering and pain be, God will make a way because he passionately loves us. We need to also to remember that we follow a crucified Jesus, and we have to keep in mind the words of St. Paul in Romans 8 verse 18. I think that whatever we suffer in this life can never be compared to the glory as that unrevealed which is waiting for us. God's love is covenanted. This is important to understand. And it is extremely important to realize that our God loves us and he has made a covenant with us. A covenanted love is different from a contractual love. In a business contract, if one party fails to meet its commitment, the second party of the contract is released from the binding effects of that contract. For example, I promise to pay you rupees 500 to cut the grass in my yard. However, you do not cut the grass, and hence I do not have to pay you the promised rupees 500. It is not this way in a covenant. A covenant implies a promise of unconditional love. It is a promise that is never canceled. A covenanted love is a love that will go 100% of the way at all times, no matter what the response of the beloved be. Covenanted love is not earned or won by the person to whom it is given. It is always a free gift. It is never withdrawn. It is forever. We are children of the new covenant, sealed by the blood of Jesus. Luke chapter 22, verse 20. Sisters and brothers, let's look at the crucifix. The unsaid words of Jesus are, I died for you because I love you. And this is what I mean when I say I love you. For me, the crucifix is an unmistakable reminder of God's love for us. The words of a song we sing at Good Friday services tells it all. My people, what more could I do for you that I have not already done? Answer me. Remember, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that all of us who believe in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Sisters and brothers, God loves you. God loves me.